everybody. Welcome back to the Film Buds podcast. This is episode number 292, and my name's Henry. This week, I'm going to be doing a bit of a JFK special. I'm going to be starting off with Parkland from 2013, starring Zac Efron, Paul Giamatti, Billy Bob Thornton, and many others. And then a review of Oliver Stone's JFK from 1991, including specific points about the director's cut version of that film. So should be a great time. Thanks as always for joining us. Please hit that subscribe button now. Give us a rating, give us a review, and thanks to all those who have recently. First thing, uh, if you have not already noticed or if you're not already a subscriber, we are doing a daily series now. So the Film Buds, at least for the time being, is a daily show where we'll be doing our Monday episodes like this as normal. And then Tuesdays through Saturdays, we'll be doing a variety of movies, kind of short mini reviews. So check those out if you have not yet. And thank you to everybody who has been listening. They seem to be a big hit. So I guess we'll keep doing them whenever possible. And we also have a bonus show page at filmbuds.bandcamp.com. We have over 70 bonus shows, I think, there right now. So please check those out if you haven't yet. They cover franchises, trilogies, actors, directors, all that sort of stuff. And then also for the show, we will be doing some picks of the week as normal. So just some other stuff I've been watching as well. Besides that, not a whole lot else. The Oscars were this past Sunday, so when Elle comes back to the regular show, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but Oppenheimer did win, which I was very happy about, and for the most part, I didn't have a lot of huge upsets. I don't care about the Oscars all that much anyways. I've been going through all of the Best Picture nominees this past week, and I will be doing those in the daily shows, as well as probably next week's episode with Elle but we will be covering all of them now in one way or the other. All right, well, not much else to say. Let's go ahead and talk Parkland. And we do have a clip, so take a listen. Mr. Zapruder, I'm Forrest Sarles, special agent in charge of the Dallas District of the United States Secret Service. Sir, did you tell Harry you took film of the motorcade today? Yes. So you did, sir. You did film the motorcade. Yes, yes. And where were you standing at the time? Okay, so as I said, Parkland came out in 2013, written and directed by Peter Landisman. Stars Zac Efron, Tom Welling, Billy Bob Thornton, Paul Giamatti, Marcia Gay Harden, Jackie Weaver, James Badge Dale, and many others. And the synopsis is a recounting of the chaotic events that occurred at Dallas's Parkland Memorial Hospital on the day President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. This one made $1.6 million against a budget of 10 so not really a big hit financially. I think reviews were decent, but not amazing. And I actually read the book that this is based on before I saw the movie. I had never heard of the book before, and so that really piqued my interest and so I burned through the book and I highly suggest that you check it out because it is pretty much a minute by minute retelling of the JFK assassination before and after and it was a very very well done well researched book and spoiler it is a lot better than the movie when it comes to JFK like many I'm intrigued by what happened the events what led up to it what happened after because there's so many unknowns there and mysteries and all of that conspiracies and we'll get to that with JFK. So I pretty much will always seek out movies and TV shows relating to this story and this era because mid 20th century is really my favorite time in history to study and learn about. And like I teased a little bit earlier, the movie I want to like it more. I think that there is some validity to it and a purpose to it in terms of telling this story for a wide audience, but I think the execution is not really there. It feels very stilted and sluggish because while, yes, there is a purpose to the story and why that's important, the direction and how they tell the story within the movie, it feels like there is not much of a purpose. You're like, all right, so why are we learning about this? You know, we could easily just go to Wikipedia and learn about all of this much quicker than watching this movie because for the most part, the movie seems to focus more so on like just facts. All right, this happened at 1037, then 
on this day, it happened at this point and that point, and there's not a whole lot of discussions there. There's not a lot of deep commentary or ideas, and so it does feel kind of shallow and a little lackluster in terms of that momentum driving the story forward. And it is interesting in terms of the hospital, Parkland Hospital, that is where both JFK died as well as Lee Harvey Oswald, who was, you know, the killer. And so I think it's interesting that both the victim and the killer were pronounced dead at the same place, because then the doctors there had to be involved with both parties. And also in terms of the JFK part, which is really teased a lot in the trailer, the doctors played by Zac Efron, at least the lead is, where he's just a normal kind of young doctor, and then suddenly JFK is thrown into the operating room, and he's like, all right, you got to operate on this guy. Try and save his life. He's the president. And it's this complete chaos, shaken reality moment, which I like. I think that's effective, and you can only imagine what that would feel like if that was you in that operating room. So all that works, but for the most part, Afterwards, it's not super interesting. I think the idea of this Abraham Zapruder, which is the guy who just by chance shot the video of JFK being shot, that is a very iconic point in history because if that had happened now, there would have been probably thousands of recordings of that same moment, like because of cell phones, television cameras, this, that, and the other. Whereas in this, he was the only guy to capture that moment or at least the only known guy, which is pretty crazy to think about. That is just something that would have only happened in that time, not now. And his realizations of, oh my God, like I just saw the president get shot. I caught it on camera. And then the FBI coming in saying, we need that video. That is the only thing that's giving us any evidence of what happened. And so I think all those discussions are interesting. And then the Oswald family is probably the most interesting part of the film in terms of the brother played by James Badge Dale, who I really like him a lot, where the brother of Lee Harvey is saying, yeah, like, I have no doubt that he killed him. Like, it sounds exactly like my brother for the most part. And so I think that's interesting in terms of the historical aspect. The only performance I don't like is Jackie Weaver as the mother of Oswald. I think she's a little goofy sort of I don't know if it's a parody, but it feels much too over the top to really work. And so I don't like her in it. I generally do, but not in this. Paul Giamatti, love him in everything. He's great. Billy Bob Thornton, Ron Livingston is good. So it's got a good cast. It's got a good setup. But that momentum, that drive, that real kind of punch is not there. And the commentary isn't there. So it's not as sharp or as biting or as intriguing as I think it is, or as I think the, the book is. So it's a serviceable movie. If you are interested in the JFK assassination or just in JFK himself, I would give it a look. You could do a lot worse. I think there are much worse ones out there. I think as we'll get to the Oliver Stone movie and then the probably the best one of all of those movies and those shows is Jackie with Natalie Portman. I think that's probably my favorite of the world of JFK and the assassination. So definitely give that one a look if you've not seen it yet, because it's amazing. Other than that, it's directed, eh, it's a, all right. There's a lot of handheld, a little too much of shoving cameras up in people's faces, and it doesn't totally work. So I think the direction is a little lame. Scores all right by James Newton Howard. And yeah, I think that's about it. I've seen it two times now, but I think if I ever wanted to go back to the story, I would just read the book. It is one of those. I think it's probably one of the best examples of a book really working as a book and not working as a movie, or at least in the way that they decided to tell it. So that is a light three out of five. All right, let's get to JFK from 1991. And we do have a clip as well, so take a listen. Anyway... After I came back, I asked myself, why was I, the chief of special ops, selected to travel to the South Pole at that time to do a job that any number of others could have done? And I wondered if it could have been because one of my routine duties, if I had been in Washington, would have been to arrange for additional security in Texas. So I decided to check it out. 
And sure enough, I found out that someone had told the 112th Military Intelligence Group at 4th Army Headquarters at Fort Sam Houston to stand down that day over the protests of the unit commander, Colonel Wright. I believe it's a mistake. This is significant because it is standard operating procedure. All right, so as I said, JFK came out in 1991. The director's cut came out maybe 15 years later. It's directed by Oliver Stone. Stars basically everyone in Hollywood. It's pretty insane. Stars Kevin Costner, Gary Oldman, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Sally Kirkland, Tommy Lee Jones, Laurie Metcalf, Michael Rooker, Sissy Spacek, and many, many, many others. John Candy. It's completely packed. And the synopsis is, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison discovers there's more to the Kennedy assassination than the official story. So I only saw this one for the first time just recently. I've been meaning to get around to it for a long time, just never did. So it was a first-time watch. First thing, Oliver Stone, don't love him totally. I think he really peaked in the early part of his career, like Platoon, Natural Born Killers, this and a few others. I think he's done some interesting work over the last two decades or so, but I think he's lost it a little bit and maybe gotten a little too involved in politics and that sort of thing, because I think he was amazing in the first part of his career. And I don't necessarily mind you getting political with art. That's just natural. It's a belief, so it's going to happen. And I don't mind if it's a viewpoint that I don't agree with. Like, that's what makes art interesting is even if it's not something you totally agree with or see the rationality of, having a different point of view can help build a perspective and or what's right and wrong. And so when Oliver Stone makes very political things, that's okay. I'm not against that. And in some ways, that's what makes him interesting and stand out. And this movie, putting all that aside, well... Before getting into how I feel about the movie, actually, sorry. Whether you consider this movie to be complete truth or complete hooey, to me, there is no denying that this movie is pretty darn entertaining. Like, it was easily one of the most entertaining political thrillers that I've ever seen. And I know it got a lot of award attention, big box office, and was a huge success when it came out. And I cannot believe how engaged I was in this movie. And I'm not here to say what I think happened or didn't happen or discredit something. And so I'm not going to say if what happened in this movie happened or not is what it is. But no matter what, it was so well put together, so entertaining, so involving, that I was basically in it from beginning to end for those three hours. It does not feel like a three-hour movie to me. And I know it's one of the big things that gets praised a lot. The editing is insane. There are so many stories going on, so many characters, so many plots, subplots, narrations, montages, different styles of cinematography going from black and white to color, very kinetic camera movements, injections of interviews and TV clips, all that stuff. It's crazy how this did not turn into a complete disaster. Like you easily could have this movie be a total mess. You can't follow anything, but It was the exact opposite. Like, I don't know how they did that. It is amazing. It's one of the most well-edited movies I've seen in ages. And it looks amazing, too. Cinematography as well. So, in that respect, it is unparalleled. Probably his most well-edited movie of his whole career. And I like the idea, in terms of the conspiracy of, like, multiple shooters and this and that, I don't mind if you want to try and tackle that. That's okay if you have some weight behind it. But I think what makes this movie work and me not really try to pick apart the pieces and just see it more as a political thriller, a neo-noir political thriller, is that it's mainly driving at the quote-unquote official account by the government of what happened. It's not saying the worldwide view. It's more so about Kevin Costner's character saying, all right, I don't like the holes in this story that was presented to me and that is being distributed to the world. I don't like that. I'm going to try and figure it out. So I think that is a good way to do it, because then it could just be seen purely as a conspiracy thriller, which in some ways it is, but there's a little bit more of a grounding to it, and that's why it works really well for me, and maybe why it's still considered to be a great movie by many at least. So 
at this point, it is probably my favorite Oliver Stone movie. Platoon might be close to it, but definitely one of the better JFK movies, regardless of fact of what's true and what's not. Definitely one of the best that I've seen. And now talking some about the director's cut, which is the version I watched. And because I had to read later about what was put in and taken out for the different versions. The big thing for me that I see why it's criticized for being injected in there is there's a scene where he goes like or sequences where he goes on TV and there are these very Kevin Costner, that is. And he is speaking with all these very goofy television reporters and people like that and it feels where it's trying to ground it in reality for the most part those make it feel more like a silly satire than abiding commentary and so that is a big big chunk that I don't like and I think it would have been better if they had taken that out then there's a scene where these cops try and set up Kevin Costner's character at an airport by like soliciting sex and it feels kind of homophobic it doesn't really need to be there. It doesn't add anything to the story or how I view them or I think other people view them within the context of the story. It feels very overdone and over the top. And so I think despite me typically loving director's cuts, I like a longer movie. I like more in there, even if it's not always perfect. I like that. I think in this case, the theatrical cut is better because these additions don't work. And they don't help. And I know that Oliver Stone apparently has said that he wants this to be the definitive version, which I think is a mistake because it sort of presents things in a worse light or tries to go too far into certain situations where you're like, all right, this is goofy. This isn't working for me. What kind of grounding basis do you have? So the theatrical cut in terms of what I am have to gather in my own brain and taking things out and, and all that, the theatrical cut is amazing. The director's cut, still a very good movie, but there were those points where I was thinking, eh, not really working. But small detail in the big scheme of things, still a great movie, and it's worth watching no matter what take you have on what happened or didn't happen. It's really worth watching just as a movie. You know, this could be completely fictional. Maybe it is. But no matter what, it's a very, very well put together movie, and I wish there was more like it out there these days other than that few quick things john williams's score is excellent gary oldman as lee harvey oswald is great i didn't realize that he was in this movie joe pesci is another great character actor in here like it's stacked i could not believe like every scene some new big popular actor was popping up i was like dang this is nuts so i would highly recommend it and yeah That is a five out of five. And also the director's cut would be probably four and a half, maybe four. But theatrical cut, five out of five for sure. All right, well, with the reviews done, can end off with picks of the week. Got a few things here. So rewatched with a friend of mine, Insomnia from 2002, the Christopher Nolan thriller, which was one of his first movies right before he did Batman Begins, I'm pretty sure. Stars Al Pacino, and it is a remake of a European film. I've seen it probably three times at this point, and I think when I first saw it, I liked it more than I do now. And maybe it didn't help that I was watching it with a friend who was kind of pointing things out that I wasn't really noticing. It is a bit goofy. I think the script and the direction and editing is a little clunky. I appreciate Nolan, who I love. I love Nolan. I appreciate him for trying something. It feels a little David Finchery in style and tone and story, which is all right. But I think it is probably my least favorite Nolan movie to date. And while Al Pacino is great, Robin Williams is great, the rest of the movie, the execution, not really there, doesn't really hold up. There's a lot of weird character moments, weird writing moments, and even direction moments. Some work, some don't. But overall, it did get a little unintentionally goofy at points. So still like it, just not an amazing movie. And then I rewatched Side Effects, the Steven Soderbergh thriller with Rooney Mara, Jude Law, Shane Tatum, Catherine Zeta-Jones. And I've seen it many, many times 
at this point, I think it is very underrated. It's really well written, written by the guy who did Contagion, Scott Z. Burns, very well researched and is a very interesting take on the quote unquote side effects of medications, how things can be warped, who can be blamed. And I don't want to give away any big spoilers, even though it's like 10 years old. There are some big twists that I don't want to get into too much, just in case you are unfamiliar with it. But very well directed, looks amazing, very good score, a lot of interesting ideas. Rooney Mara, I love. She's amazing. Jude Law, can't beat him. And the whole cast is excellent. And there's a lot of good twists and turns at the end where one person is getting the ups on another one and then back and forth. And it's very well constructed. And it makes sense, to me at least, totally, despite all the moving pieces. So definitely do check that out if you like Soderbergh, if you like crime, mystery, thriller, that sort of thing. It's definitely one of my favorites. And also, random fact, I do have a bit of a nostalgic love for this movie because it came out when I was in college and I didn't have a car and I was desperate to go see movies because I was bored. And so I took a few buses and actually crossed a highway to get over to this movie theater. And so I went on quite a journey to see this for the first time. And so I'll always kind of remember that as is probably the first one I saw in college that obviously left a memorable mark because of that <laughs> quest to try and get to that theater to see anything really. So, and thankfully it was a good movie. And then lastly, I rewatched Saving Mr. Banks, the Disney film with Tom Hanks and Emma Thompson. And I'll just go ahead and say it. I think this movie is one of the most underrated films I've seen in a long, long time, or that has come out in quite some time. It is so affecting and so touching. It is beautifully directed and edited and written. Tom Hanks, of course, always great. Emma Thompson, always great. She is amazing in this movie. And there's such a sort of childlike feel to her and performance to her because it is, sorry if you don't know, it is about the creator of Mary Poppins working with Disney, Walt Disney, to get the movie made because she's very hesitant because it's largely about her father and she wants her father to be presented in the right way. And it has all these continuous flashbacks to her childhood, which is very, very grim. And it's got a perfect tone in terms of being able to get into very sad, heavy drama to being funny and musical. It's perfectly balanced, in my opinion. So charming. It's funny. It's really a bit of a tearjerker. Like Colin Farrell, who plays this very troubled father of hers when she's a kid, how he presents and how they present it overall, but his performance, which is largely about alcoholism, problems with alcoholism, and overall depression, loneliness, life struggles where he can't get ahead and he's his own worst enemy. It is perfect. Like, sure, you can call it melodramatic or over the top, but I think how he communicates those things is spot on. And it's so heartbreaking in a lot of ways because there's some good soul there, but he's always getting in his own way and it gets in the way of his family and all that. So I love him in this movie. It's probably my favorite part. And I think it's where I really started to love Colin Farrell as an actor. He is amazing. Great score, a very interesting story in terms of creating entertainment and art and working with these different parties and all that. So it's a very, very good movie. I wish more people would see it because I never really hear it mentioned. It is one that I think, since it is Disney, it's this sort of melodramatic drama. Maybe it gets the wrong reputation or it rubs people the wrong way, but I think it's amazing. And it does all of the simple, normal things incredibly well. And I'll always go back to it because it's always one that leaves me sort of drained, but in a good way. And that's on Disney Plus, if you haven't. All right, well, I think that is about it. Next week, I don't want to get into the habit of saying stuff that ends up changing in terms of what we're reviewing next week or if L will be back or not. I want to just leave that in the gray for right now, but there will be more daily shows as normal. Hopefully, we'll be doing that week to week. Maybe if we get too backed up, it may be every other week, or maybe we'll just skip one week in the month. I don't know. But I love doing it so much, I'm going to do it whenever possible. And if you have any ideas in terms of release dates or how to do it, how to schedule it, let me know through any of the contact information below. 
but there's still plenty of great content coming, so don't worry. And as always, subscribe, rate, review, please, right now if you haven't yet. And thank you again to all those who have. Follow us on social media at FilmBuds, me and my wife and co-host L on Letterboxd, and all that is in the show notes, as I've said. So, as always, hope you enjoyed it even half as much as I did, and I'll see you next time.